Hey friends, it's Rachel. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Rachel Terry and I am the author of two young adult fantasy novels. Lightbringer is available now for purchase and Flameseeker is available for pre-order now. It releases September 12th. All the relevant links will be in the description box down below, but we are not here to talk about that today. Today I will be sharing my review of Homecoming by Kate Morton and it's been a while since I've done one of these book reviews, so I'll try my best, but bear with me. There was a time when I thought I wouldn't be doing any of these book reviews again because I have crossed the line into being a published author, but I see no conflict of interest for giving positive praise for books that I genuinely enjoyed. I do find it difficult to do positive reviews compared to negative reviews because when I like something about a book it's usually hard to describe why that is, whereas if I don't like a book it's usually for a well-defined reason, so I will do my best. Also I have to mention that this book fried my brain a little bit, so I don't know how it's gonna go. But this is the first of Kate Morton's books that I've read. It's a dual a timeline story. One timeline takes place in 1959 and the other takes place in 2018. The 2018 timeline follows Jess who is working as a journalist in London and she receives a call that her grandmother Nora has fallen trying to go up into the attic and so she is forced to fly to Australia to be with her grandmother. And while she's there, she discovers events that happened in the other timeline in 1959 on Christmas Eve that her family was involved in that she had no previous knowledge of. And this event was known as the Turner Family Tragedy. So members of the Turner family were found killed on Christmas Eve while they were on a picnic. And this was Isabel Turner and her children. The baby was missing from the scene. She was not in her cradle which had been tied up in a tree and so searchers were trying to find the baby. They had no idea how this family had died. There was no visible signs of violence or that somebody had come upon the scene and done this to them and so it's a mystery. And the reason that this involves Jess's family is because her grandmother Nora's brother was the wife of Isabel Turner, the woman whose children died. It was Jess's grandmother's brother's children who were killed along with his wife. And Jess had no idea about any of this and this event seems to have been dredged up and caused her grandmother Nora distress that led her to try to climb up into the attic for whatever reason and led to her falling while she was up there. And along the way Jess uncovers secrets about her family and about who she is and what really happened that night. So I can't really explain too much of what this book is about and why I loved it so much without going into spoilers, but what I really loved about this book and it being my first of Kate Morton's that I've read was the way that the characters were drawn out. It's kind of sort of a mystery but it's not a mystery that I'm used to reading because it's not like you're trying to uncover a killer or something like that. It's a mystery of families and secrets and trying to find out who you really are. And Jess learns that Nora, her grandmother, whom she loves very much, isn't who she thought she was. And the reason that she's so close with her grandmother is because her grandmother basically raised her. Her grandmother was a sort of mother to her. And the reason for this is that Jess was not close with her own mother, Polly. Polly wasn't close with Nora. They were estranged and Polly left Jess to be raised by her grandmother. And that is one of the beliefs that Jess has that is challenged throughout this entire process. This book takes place mostly in Australia. That is where the 1959 timeline comes in and that is where Jess goes in the more modern current timeline in 2018. And I don't read that many books that are set in Australia. That part of the world, the seasons are flipped from where I live. So I kept having to remind myself that even though it's Christmas Eve when the 1959 timeline and the tragedy takes place, it's very hot and it's summer and that's why the family goes out for a picnic. We think of Christmas as being very cold here where I live and I had to keep reminding myself that it's opposite over there. I really like the writing style in this book. It was lyrical and it flowed and I don't usually notice the writing style when I'm reading a book and if I do it's because it's probably not that good and it draws attention to itself. I've said that before here on this channel but in this case I noticed how much it was good and how much I loved it. And I was actually proofing Flameseeker at the time I was reading this book and I kept comparing my book to this one which was not a good idea because you shouldn't do that ever. It's not going to make you happy if you do and they're completely different genres with completely different audiences but 
it was so good and so masterfully done that I could pick up on that and I was like, well, I hope I'm that good one day. But again, they're completely different books. But I wanted to say that I really enjoyed the writing style, this sense of setting of time and place, and just the past and your family and people that you know and all of this stuff. It just all combined to be something that I really enjoyed. But of course the main reason why I liked this book so much was the twists and the turns and the mystery and the secrets that were revealed and that's why the book fried my brain. So let me explain what happened and this is going to go into spoiler territory. It's clear that the Turner family did not just die of natural causes. Someone killed them somehow and poison is obviously the most logical choice because there's no sign of violence and at the time in 1959 there were no definitive answers as to what this poison would be. The pathologist checked for known poisons that could be detected at the time and ultimately could come up with nothing. And it was concluded that Isabel Turner murdered herself and her children because of depression, basically. She was in a depressed state. Her husband, Thomas Turner, who was Jess's grandmother's brother, was in England at the time. He was gone a lot, and it was also revealed later that he had taken up with another woman, which further added to Isabel's depressive state. She had been feeling this way ever since the new baby arrived, and though they may not have had the term for it at the time, it's implied that Isabel Turner was suffering from postpartum depression or psychosis and it was these things that led her to kill herself and her children. She also visited the reverend and asked if it was ever okay for a mother to leave her children behind and the reverend counseled her that it really isn't. She should take her children with her and that testimony was later looked at as his words inspired her to take her children with her into the afterlife because instead of just killing herself she killed her children as well. Knowing that there was probably some sort of twist this didn't sit well with me. I didn't really ever believe that Isabel Turner was guilty although there was lots of evidence against her and no. She's not guilty. She didn't kill herself and she didn't kill her children. She may have been in a depressive state or a sad mood for an extended period of time, but this was never her intention and she didn't do this. So then it becomes a question of who did. It becomes clear that several characters who were involved in the discovery of the scene were not telling the complete truth in earlier chapters and that they did things that would be very suspicious. As I mentioned, the baby was missing. The baby was not found at the scene and the man who stumbled upon the scene, Percy Summers, his wife Meg has the baby at home when he returns and she shows him and he's like, what are you doing? How do you have this baby? And she explains that she came across the scene before he did and then she decided to take the baby because she couldn't leave the baby there all alone and there was nothing she could do with the family. Meg Summers has wanted a daughter for a long time. The couple has two sons and for a while I thought maybe she stole the baby because she wanted it for herself but she does eventually agree that it should be returned to Nora Turner Bridges as the only surviving member of the family here. So Percy takes the baby and leaves it in the rose garden at the house. And Nora, Jess's grandmother, comes out and takes the baby. Percy doesn't see this happen because he's distracted by a noise that he hears and he's worried about dogs because when they find the scene initially and they find the family dead and the baby is missing, they think wild dogs might have taken the baby away. So when he hears a noise, he's worried about dogs or maybe somebody watching him do this because if they see him bring the baby that was missing up to the house without having reported it to the police, it will look very bad for him. So he goes to investigate and finds nothing. And when he returns, the baby is gone and he didn't see Nora take the baby. And you wonder, did she? Or did something drag the baby away? Did someone take the baby away? Because Jess finds out that a baby's remains were later found in the, that very location in the Rose Garden and it's sad because the baby that was thought to have survived didn't. Because her grandmother didn't want her to know any of this, Jess learns the details from a book that was published by an American journalist who happened to be in the area at the time and interviewed Nora and people in the town and then wrote a book about it and so this is how Jess learns things and 
this is how she learns that a baby's remains were found at that very spot. So you as the reader are led to believe that the baby was not taken by Nora, the baby was ultimately killed. That is not true. So at the time that Nora is visiting her family in Australia, she is pregnant with Polly and that is why she is there. The shock of the news of hearing that her sister-in-law and her children were found dead sends her into labor early. This is a frustrating thing for Nora to have to deal with because she has wanted a child for so long and been unable to have one. And now she's finally made it all this way with Polly and the baby basically is born early, but the baby is born. However, it is revealed that Nora's baby dies and she buries it in the rose garden. And this explains a previous mention of why she hates roses and never wanted any of them at her house. So her own baby dies and she buries it in the garden. And when she finds the surviving Turner baby in the garden brought by Percy Summers, she takes the baby in and passes it off as her own. So it is revealed in one of the big twists that Polly is not actually Nora's daughter at all. She is the surviving daughter of Isabel Turner, this woman who was much maligned and accused of killing herself and her children. And that means that Nora is not actually Jess's grandmother either. In another twist, it's later revealed that the man Polly believed to be her father all this time wasn't, obviously it wasn't Nora's husband because she's not Nora's daughter even, but it also wasn't Nora's brother Thomas Turner who was the husband of Isabel Turner because Isabel was having an affair with another man because Thomas was gone all the time and she was lonely and these two bonded over a common love of reading. And that man was Percy Summers. Little did he know that the baby that he brought to the Turner house and laid in the garden to be found was actually his daughter that Nora then passed off as hers. Polly did get to meet him before he died, which is sort of a nice closure because she didn't know who her real father was after she tracked down the man she believed to be her father, which was Nora's husband, and it was confirmed that that in fact was not the case. Nora always claimed that he wasn't Polly's father and she was telling the truth to both of them when she claimed that. She also always told Polly as a child whenever she asked why she didn't have a father and the other children did and made fun of her was that she appeared and Nora found her in a flower patch and that is true. She did because she rescued Polly from the rose garden. Ultimately you do find out who killed the family and all of these twists and turns I saw coming right before the characters did and I credit that to me reading so many mysteries and writing them as well and being suspicious of everyone so I'm not really sure that there could ever be a twist that would surprise me just because I'm suspicious of everyone and everything but it's revealed that after you find out Percy was having an affair with Isabel Turner and is actually Polly's father. You learn that one of Percy's sons found out about the affair and was very upset about this. And the Summers had a dog that died recently after an encounter with a pufferfish, which I have venom, which led to the dog unfortunately dying. And the son became inspired by this and he got a hold of a pufferfish and intended to use it to poison Isabel Turner because she was having an affair with his father and taking him away from his family. But he was caught with the pufferfish by Meg Summers, Percy's wife, and his mother who encouraged her son not to go through with this and really he realized he couldn't do it anyway. She took the pufferfish away from him and she ran a store in town. She was preparing Christmas presents for everyone and also dishes for them to enjoy for the holiday. One of these dishes was fish paste, which Isabel Turner loved very much. And at the beginning of the book, you know that Meg Summers made fish paste for Isabel Turner and had one of her sons deliver it up at the house before they set off for their picnic. And she used the puffer fish for the fish paste. And nobody else was ever supposed to be hurt. Nobody else was supposed to be killed because this was Isabel Turner's thing. She never shared it with anybody else. It was something that she could enjoy on her own. But unfortunately, one way or another, all of the children ate some of the fish paste that day on their picnic and they all died poisoned by the watering hole where they chose to have their picnic. Meg Summers was at the scene. She took the baby from the scene, remember? She was there because she was checking up on her handiwork and wanted to make sure that her fish paste had done its job. The baby was unharmed. She took the baby from the scene and brought it back home. 
What I find really disturbing about all of this is that Meg Summers went on the rest of her life knowing what she'd done and never told anybody and never seemed upset about it. I understand her motivation for wanting to get back at Isabel or hurt her because she's having an affair with her husband, but she loves children. Meg wanted a daughter for her very own, and that's partly why I thought she had taken the baby in the first place. She has two sons, and yet she's responsible for murdering all of Isabel Turner's children in addition to Isabel. Isabel was the only target that Meg had intended, but she still killed an entire family. And yet she never owns up to what she did, and she never really seems sorry about it either. And I think Meg, despite her generosity, despite the outward portrayal that she has in the village, she's a very wicked person. Meg also knew that the baby that Nora, Jess's grandmother, was pushing around in a perambulator in the village wasn't her own. She knew that it was the baby that had been taken from the scene by her, Meg, and Nora kind of knew that she knew, and she also suspected what Meg had done. So they both knew each other's secrets and knew that they knew, and so neither of them ever said anything. They both kept each other's secrets because they knew that if one of them said something, then the other one would reveal what they knew, which I think is really messed up on both of them. And it explains why Nora was so protective of Polly that she basically suffocated her and Polly couldn't take it anymore and she just had to get out and have her own life. Nora was so protective of Polly because Polly wasn't really hers and she had lost the one baby that she managed to have and she didn't want anything to happen to Polly and she didn't want anybody to realize that Polly wasn't really hers because they might take her away after everything. And so it really wasn't what Jess thought that her grandmother and her mother had become estranged and it was all just a mess of miscommunication and lies and secrets. And yeah, it was really interesting. It was really twisty and messed up and I really enjoyed it and I'm eager to read more of Kate Morton's books. I hope that I will love them just as much as this. I've probably forgotten a lot of things and I hope that people don't really watch the spoiler part unless they've already read the book or if they have absolutely no intention whatsoever of ever reading this book because I cannot fully explain all the twists and turns and red herrings and just secrets that come out over the course of this book that challenge the characters' preconceived notions and what they think about themselves and their families and it's just really twisty. It melted my brain a little bit. I wanted to keep reading to find out what happened and to have the truth revealed but I also knew that I didn't because then it would be over. That's a rare feeling for me to get from a book nowadays and that's why I didn't want the book to end. I wanted to savor it because I knew that this was a rare book right here and this is not something that I get every day very often. But I am super happy that I read it. It's a tale of family secrets, lies that are told, how far we would go to protect the people that we love, and also to protect ourselves. And it also is a pretty good example of how one action, whether that be selfish or not, can have wide-reaching effects and consequences. It's like the smallest pebble dropped into a lake. You'd be surprised how far those ripples will go. So it's just a very fascinating sort of journey and exploration of the human motivation, the human nature, the human mind, and I loved it and I highly recommend it to anybody who has not yet read it. So yeah, that's all I have to say. I hope that was clear. I feel like the spoiler section is very complicated and I wanted to try my best to explain what actually happened and how that's found out, but if you haven't read the book and you didn't have everything just spoiled for yourself, I highly encourage you to go read it. It was quite long, but it didn't feel long, and I was very pleased with how realistic and sympathetic the characters were. So there you have it. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed, feel free to leave a like, comment, and subscribe so you don't miss out on any future content. I appreciate each and every one of you. My name is Rachel Terry. I am the author of two young adult fantasy books. Links will be in the description box down below. I appreciate each and every one of you, and I will see you in the next video. Bye!